Good. I'm glad somebody is. Glad you made it here in spite of this storm that's coming. And um, it is Father's Day, and a lot of folks are traveling to see dads and to visit them. We're glad you're here today. I don't know if you've noticed, Audrey and Nimi and I came over last night about 8 o'clock to load all the slides and everything you see. And somebody yesterday afternoon decided to leave College Road and uh, hit our sign. So uh, they didn't drive away from it. I can assure that if you look at the damage to car parts, strong all the way across. So uh, uh, we'll have to get a police report filed this week and get an insurance claim. So just uh, they did that before the storm hit. So... Uh, I hope they're okay. So glad you're here today. Go ahead and take out your sermon notes. And uh, we're beginning a new series today called uh, Superheroes. And um, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a hero. The Bible is full of them. And I want to use a lot of those stories in Scripture that illustrate how all of us can be a superhero uh, to others and to people around us. Now, we live in an age of where Hollywood has made billions of dollars off of superhero movies. And when you think of superheroes, you might think of people like Superman or Batman or Thor or Captain America or the Green Lantern and the Black Panther. I mean, you just go on Spider-Man. I mean, you just go on and on and on. I mean, they got them. DC Comics and Marvel, they have made billions of dollars in making movies, putting the superheroes up on screens for us, okay? And, and the, the movies are outstanding, I'll say that, I love them all, I go see them all, and growing up, Superman was always my uh, superhero, and I have friends, they have others, and whatever yours is, that's great, I'll, I'm glad you have them. Just for the record, just shout out, if you have a, a Marvel or DC comic superhero, who is it? Captain America. Captain America. Of course, all the women are going, Wonder Woman, Okay. Yes, Wonder Woman. I uh, won't tell you she's mine too, okay? But anyway, you know, um, glad you're here. And we're going to look at what it means to be a superhero. And the Bible, as I said, is full of stories where people rose up and did unbelievable heroic acts uh, for God. And what I want to talk about today is how you can be just a superhero in your everyday life. At home, at work, at school, at the marketplace, at a restaurant, in the neighborhood, even around the world. So, because of this, I have a few questions I want to launch with today. What makes a real hero? And why do we need heroes in our lives anyway? And how do you become a hero? And since this is Father's Day, I'm going to connect being a superhero to being a superhero dad today. But the three principles I'm going to give you, you can apply to your life. You don't have to be a dad. They, they can apply. I'm just kind of customizing it for Father's Day today. And... Uh, what is disturbing to me is in a recent Gallup poll, Gallup poll said, get this, 36% of kids ages 13 to 17 said they could not name a single adult that they would consider a hero. In fact, I quote, many of them said, I don't know any adult that I'd like to model my life after. Now, that is sad. That is horrible. It really is. Okay? We all need heroes. Heroes challenge us. They motivate us. They push us. And if 36% of kids today or 38% of kids today say, I don't know one adult, that's sad to me because heroes, they inspire us. They motivate us. They challenge us to rise above ourselves to be who we need to be. And you need heroes in your life. All of us need heroes in our life, okay? I love what God says in Psalm 16, 3, he says, the godly people in the land are my true heroes, okay? I take pleasure in them. So if you tell me who your heroes are, I can tell you what you're becoming. And if you say, I don't have any heroes at all, that means you have no real values in your life. Nothing's that important to you because we all need heroes in our life, okay? And today, I know this word hero is a well overused word, like the word genius and the word icon and all these things that we hear over and over, and they do get used and misused, okay? But there is a big difference in being a hero and being a celebrity. In our culture today, a lot of celebrities are considered heroes, but they're not. Celebrities make a big splash. Heroes make a big difference in the lives of others. Celebrities are all about image and fame. Heroes are about character and service. Celebrities are famous for what they sacrifice for themselves, whereas heroes are those who sacrifice for others. Celebrities want everybody to serve them. Heroes focus on serving others. 
If I had to give another name for celebrities, they're not heroes, they're zeros. They really are, okay? And, and anybody today can go out and make a YouTube video and put it on there and they see how many hits they get or on social media. And I, I'm just amazed how people do this today. And there's all these junk TV reality TV shows that people go do stupid things just so they get their 15 minutes of fame. And, our, and to me, our culture has way too many celebrities who are considered heroes and not genuine heroes. Okay? And God has called you, he's called me to be a superhero in this culture, in our lives, okay? And so today, I want to give you three principles that can help you do this. And like I said, it is Father's Day, and I'm, I've kind of customized it to this, but all of us can use these three principles, okay? So here's the first principle, okay? Qualities of a superhero dad are for anyone. A superhero dad stands alone for what is godly and biblical, a superhero dad, a superhero person is willing to stand alone, go against the tide, go against the culture, okay? They don't do what everyone else is doing just because everyone else is doing it, okay? Real heroes go against the crowd. They go against the culture. Real heroes are willing to swim upstream, not with the stream. And I want to show you uh, some examples here in Scripture. One's first out of the Old Testament. And um, these are, according to the prophet Samuel, were three of David's top superheroes. Notice what it says. These are the three most heroic men in David's army. The first was Joseph Bathshebeth from Tashimon, known also as Adino, the Enzyt. He once killed 800 men in one battle. Next in rank was Eleazar, the son of Dodo and grandson of Ahohi. He was one of three men who, with David, held back the Philistines that time when the rest of the Israeli army fled. He killed the Philistines until his hand was too tired to hold his sword, and the Lord gave him a great victory. But the rest of the army did not return until it was time to collect the loot. After him was Shammah, the son of a G from Ahar. Once during a Philistine attack, when all of his men deserted and fled, he stood alone at the center of the field of lentils and beat back the Philistines, and God gave him a great victory. Now, when I look at that list, I think, man, all those are great superheroes. If anybody had an excuse for not being a superhero, it was probably Eleazar. I mean, his father's a dodo. I mean, how would you like that? I want you to introduce you to my dad. He's, he's a dodo. His name is Dodo, okay? But this man didn't care about what his lineage was. He didn't care what his dad's name was. He's a superhero according to Scripture, okay? So no matter what your parents were like, if you had the worst dad on the planet, you can no longer as an adult blame your dad for the choices you make today. It's always easier to blame other people than to take personal responsibility for your own choices. Now, they did affect us, whether they raised us to the best of their ability or not, whether they were always the best dad or not. When you become an adult, God holds you responsible for your choices. And so... Eleazar, he didn't care his dad was named Dodo. He went out there and he fought. Okay? And though you may not be in a real military battle, dads, you're going to be in an ethical battle. You're going to face moral battles. You're going to face spiritual battles in your life. You're going to be caught up in relational battles. We all do. In fact, in fact when God led the people out of Egypt, he said this through the Moses. He said, say this to them. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. And every week you get an opportunity not to follow the crowd, to be a real hero by standing up for what's right. When everyone else is at work, I mean, I remember where, before I ever went into the ministry, I was in the public sector. And I, I, I was always amazed how people would use company materials for personal things. It always bothered me. They would run off personal things on company computers or printers for their own personal use. That's wrong. Or they take company pens or they would falsify their time sheets or their time cards. That's wrong. And, and if you're at a school, you're in a student, you're going to face opposition. Or, or will you refuse to cheat when everyone else is cheating or going out and getting drunk when everyone else in your class is going out and getting drunk? Okay? A real hero stands alone. They go against the crowd. I love what Isaiah 5.22 says, it says this, What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. 
there's sorrow in going along with the crowd. It, there is. And in our culture, we're pressured to give in to this. But if you think about it, I mean, I mean, I grew up in an alcoholic home. If I know what alcohol is, anybody does. I've seen more Stanleys drunk. I mean, they, I mean, they just can't hold their liquor. And you may think getting drunk is fun, but I've never seen anything fun in it. Because I just think getting drunk is a way to mask your fears and bad memories you have. You're not really dealing with the real issue. You're just trying to numb yourself from it. And you may think you're some type of superman, but really, I'm not trying to fit anybody. You're just a stupid man. Because you're not dealing with the real issue. Real heroes face real issues about themselves, and they deal with it. We've all had that deep desire to fit in. Every one of us. We all want to go to be accepted and be loved, and to, we want people to like us. So I got a couple of questions for you. How, how often have you kept silent at work or on a ball game or a soccer match? Somebody starts talking about something that you know was wrong, and you wimped out, and you said nothing. You know sometimes silence isn't golden. It's just plain yellow. And if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. You see, dads, folks, we live in a culture that values tolerance over truth. And, and, and we get this message from the mainstream media to tolerate everything, every lifestyle, every choice. And if we don't, they say we're bigoted, we're racist, we're prejudiced, uh, we're closed-minded, we're stupid, we're behind the times. And I've, I've even had people say, don't you know there's no such thing as absolutes? I go, just listen to what you just said. You said there are no absolutes. Is that right? Right. Well, then you just made one. People say there's no direct right or wrong. That you should accept any kind of lifestyle. That there's no right or wrong. So a real hero has the courage to speak up, to stand up. And dads, you're going to find yourselves, men, you're going to find yourselves in situations at work, in the marketplace, wherever you are. Where you've got to make a choice. Will I just sit back and stay silent or will I speak the truth no matter who it offends? You're at work, you're on the golf course, wherever you are. Ladies, you're with your friends, your girlfriends. You're with a, at lunch, and all of a sudden they start gossiping about people. Are you going to abstain from that? Say, I don't think we should do this. I, just this past week, <laughs> uh, I, I watched a video of a Methodist, Methodist pastor here in town. Uh, he pastors a church just right down the road from me on Masonboro Loop Road. And his youth pastor posted this video of his pastor talking about why the church should be open to homosexuality. In fact, he says in the video, if Jesus Christ was here today, he would have no problem himself doing same-sex marriages. And he said, why? Because these people have no choice. God made them that way. All right, here's why my brain thinks, well, I guess God made the pedophile that way. God made the serial killer that way. You can build a case to blame God for everything wrong in this world. You see, I've had people pressure me to cave in on a lot of issues like against abortion, homosexuality, all these things. And my response is always the same. I fear the disapproval of God more and I fear the disapproval of you. And that's what it means to stand alone. I'm not holding myself up as a model only. I'm just saying when you find yourselves in that situation, are you going to buckle? Are you going to bend? Or are you going to be brave and stand strong? And our culture will assassinate you if you do. I mean, just look at the media, how they come after people today. Come after pastors today. Come after Christians today who take a stand for what is biblically right. This is why Paul warns us in Romans 12 too. He says this, do not model your behavior, okay? Do not model your behavior on the contemporary world, but let the renewing of your mind transform you so that you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and mature. That's what he tells us to do. We are to not follow the example of our culture. David writes in Psalm 40, verse 4, Blessed are you who give yourselves over to God. Turn your back on the world's sure thing, and you ignore what the world worships. That's what it means to stand alone, dads. And the Bible is full of men and women who stand alone. They're not perfect. The one of the things I love about Scripture is that 
while God shows us their wonderful successes, he also shows us their big failures. That God uses us as heroes in spite of our failures. God used Abraham to stand against a very pagan culture called Sodom and Gomorrah in his day. God used Noah to stay in opposition for 120 years to build this ark. The world had never seen rain. Can you imagine people walking by and joking about him? If you ever can go to Kentucky, they've built a replica of it there. You can see how big this thing was, or is. I mean, for 120 years, he's out there going, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, and people are making fun of him. But he kept building the ark. I think about Daniel, who didn't give in to pressure and found himself thrown into a lion's den. I think about Moses, who stood along and challenged the most powerful man in the world of that day, Pharaoh. What about you? Are you willing to take a stand, Dad, men, women, to do what is right? And when you look at heroes, superheroes, there's a fundamental characteristic that they all have. They're willing to do what's godly. They're willing to do what's biblical when nobody else agrees with them. So dads, are you willing to stand alone for what's right in the face of criticism or ridicule or rejection? Dads, are you willing to train your children on how to stand alone rather than just to go along? We, we, a lot of times we just throw our kids out into the world and expect them to survive. They can't do it on their own. One of the biggest issues today in the American family is the absentee dad. He's not there. Or if he lives in the house, he's not parenting. He leaves it up to his wife or the mother. Dad's God has put the responsibility of parenting on us. We're the ones who are to raise up our children in the way of the Lord. Here's the second quality of a superhero dad. A real superhero dad makes sacrifices for others. Now notice I said for others and not just for themselves. A lot of people make sacrifices for themselves. A lot of people will sacrifice their health to make a lot of money. High achievers can do a lot of sacrificing, but it's usually for self-centeredness and personal gain. And technically, sports or athletes, they're not really superheroes. They're just good at what they do. They, pay, they sacrifice to become as good as they are in the sport they play. It's really what makes what they do off the field or off the court that determines whether or not they're a good superhero. Okay? In fact, sometimes superheroes put their, their desires ahead of others, and even, even for they'll sacrifice for people they don't even know because that's what a superhero does. I, I read this week about a story that happened in New York City. It was in a subway station. A 19-year-old film student named Cameron Hollipeter suffered a seizure, and he stammered across the platform and then fell down between the two tracks, between a track of a subway train, and the train was coming. On that same platform was a 50-year-old construction worker named Wesley Altry. He noticed the distress and noticed no one else was doing anything to help or save this young man because the subway train was coming. He had two daughters with him, two young daughters. He said, stay right here. And placing himself in great danger, Altry jumped down onto the tracks and grabbed hold of this young man and in the track itself, between the two rails, was a water ditch. And he grabbed the kid whose arms and legs were hanging over the tracks, pulled them in, and he positioned themselves just down in that track, that, that path. And the subway train went right over them. The only thing it nicked was the shirt on his back. But he saved the kid. And as word spread about this heroic act that he had done, Mayor Michael Bloomberg presented him with the city's highest award for civic achievement, calling him a great man, a, a hero, one who makes us all proud to be New Yorkers. Altry also received a $10,000 check from Donald Trump, a trip to Disney World, and a year's supply of Metro cards to ride the subway trains as much as he wanted for free for a year. Even his boss went and bought him a hero sub sandwich to say thank you for doing this. When he was interviewed, by the national media for doing such a death-defying act of bravery, he said, what better way to start off a new year than saving someone's life? That's the only reason I did it. I read about a, a dad who was uh, reflecting, he was having a conversation with his 
young children about superheroes, and he said, you know, when I was a kid, my heroes were Babe Ruth, Thomas Jefferson, Andy Griffith, the Long Ranger, and Super Friends. He said, then I grew up, and somebody pointed out to me that Babe Ruth was an alcoholic, Thomas Jefferson was an adulterer, Andy Griffith smoked, and the Long Ranger even had to hand over his mask, and then the Super Friends weren't even real. He said, so all my heroes are stripped of their dignity. So how do you become a truly great superhero, Dad? Jesus tells us, look at this, in Matthew chapter 20. He says this, whoever wants to be great, okay, must become a servant to all. So superheroes, they make these sacrifices for others. And Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, whoever wants to be great, okay, you become a servant to all. Not a celebrity, but a servant. Now, a lot of people, they want the, they want the 15 minutes of fame. There are not a lot of people out there who say, my goal in life is to serve other people. My goal in life is to help as many people as I can. Most people's goal in life is to get other people to help them to serve them. Because our society is built on not us sacrificing for others, but getting everyone to sacrifice for ourselves. Our culture is built on think of yourself first. Think of you first before you think of anybody else. And when I think about who made the greatest sacrifice for all of us, it was Jesus Christ. He died. I mean, if somebody died for you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be worth your time to be appreciative of that? In the book of Hebrews, it says this, Jesus brought the sacrifices for all sins of all people once and for all when he sacrificed himself. Jesus paid for your sin and my sin. He did that for us. Being a Christ-like hero, dad, superhero dad, does not mean, it does not mean being spectacular. It just simply means being a servant. And the best way you can do that is with your children, is to be a servant to your children. Jesus said this in Mark 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. One of the best examples of Jesus doing this is when he took his disciples and he washed their nasty, dirty feet. Okay? Dad's one of the best ways you can be a servant is to change those dirty diapers. I, 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 you know, I didn't have to worry about that with Emmy. We got her when she was 13. But I have babysat. I'll tell you this, I, I have gagged enough. Okay? Okay? Real dads do what's necessary, even when it's dirty, even when it's nasty. Real dads stay up with a sick kid who's throwing up and who has diarrhea. You're willing to get dirty because you're a servant to your children. She said this in Matthew 10. Even if you give a cup of cold water to one of the least of my fathers, you will be surely rewarded. I read about a man recently who had taught in the children's church Sunday school for almost 30 years. And after his wife and he got home from church one Sunday, he said this to her. He said, you know, I've been serving in this Sunday school class, teaching these children for years and years and years. I just feel used. And his wife said, why are you so upset? You're always asking God to use you. A real superhero dad doesn't mind being used by God. You don't mind being used up, all your energy, all your emotions. God does his greatest work through unsung superheroes all the time. I love what Proverbs 31 says. Speak for the people who cannot speak for themselves. Protect the rights of all who are helpless. Speak for them and protect the rights of the poor and the needy. That's what a superhero does. They stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. See, the purpose of influence is not so that you can be famous. The purpose of influence is so that you can help other people who have no influence. You ask, how do, how do I help this person who on their own cannot help themselves? How do I speak up for people who cannot speak up for themselves? You go, well, I don't really know anybody that needs for me to speak up for them. Oh, yes, you do. How about children? You could speak up for children. You could speak up for the unborn child. You could speak up for people who are sick. You could speak up for people who have mental challenges and mental issues and mental diseases. You could speak up for the orphans. There's a lot of different groups you could speak up for. I mean, think about all the people around the world that you could be a voice for. Because God commands us to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. 
So I've got a personal question for you, dads. It's for all of us. Is there any area of your life where you're sacrificing to serve other people on a regular basis? You don't get paid to do it. You just do it. You do it out of love for God and out of love to serve other people. Maybe there is a dad here today who you could start a small group for men in our church. There's a lot of young men in our church who needs a mentor, someone who's older and more mature in the faith, who will take these younger men and say, hey, let me teach you from my own mistakes and my successes how to be a great godly dad and husband. You see, dads, they need heroes as well as they need to be a superhero. They need someone to teach them how to sacrifice for their family and how to sacrifice for God. And the best way to do that, if you're an older man, is to take some younger guy under your wing and do it. Here's the third quality of a superhero dad. A real superhero dad takes risks for God. I've always been a risk taker. But I've been around a lot of people who want to play it safe. God put this natural desire in all of us to take risks. That's why people go gamble in Las Vegas. Okay? People like the game of chance all the time. It's why people play sports. It's why people do mountain climbing. Now, you may have tamed down your passion to take a risk, but God has put in all of us this desire to take a risk because real superheroes are not afraid to go out on a limb because they know that's where the best fruit is. Real superheroes take risks. They defy the odds. They risk rejection. They risk criticism in order to serve others. There are risks. You may be misunderstood, you may be used, but you still take the risk. Now, I know there's a lot of people who take unnecessary risks. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? And they'll even try to spiritualize, well, I'm doing this for God. No, that's just stupidity. But let me give you a couple of reasons why most people are afraid to take risks, why even dads today are afraid to take risks. One, we want to be comfortable. I tell you all the time, God's more interested in building your character than in making you comfortable. We want to be comfortable. We want all of the ifs removed. If you can give me a guaranteed success, then I might do it. It's uncomfortable to stretch muscles you haven't stretched in a while. If, you're ever, if you've been away from the gym for a while and you go back and you start pumping iron, you're going to feel it the next day. Okay? So one of the reasons people don't want to take risks is they want to be comfortable. Here's the second reason. We're afraid of failure. People today are afraid of failure. I have, I've never been afraid to fail. Okay? Failure is not about, fatal is not, failure is not fatal. Failure is not final. You never are a failure until you just give up. Failure is not as bad as the fear of failure. The fear of failure is far worse than failure itself because when you have the fear of failure in your life, think about it over and over, it gets into you, gets in you, and you go, I don't know if I should do this. 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 I'm not talking about whether you should ride a roller coaster or not. Okay? My wife, is she, she has this fear of heights. If you want to get her praying really well, take her up. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. We all have this, people have a fear of failure. We want all of the, what possibly could go wrong, removed. And if you fail, there's nothing wrong in that. Proverbs 24, 16 says this, though a godly person fails seven times, that person rises again. And what I love about that verse, it says godly people, even though they fail, they get right back up on the horse. They fail, they get right back up on that horse. They fail, they get right back up. They're not going to let an unbroken chain, this constant failure, stop them from trying to succeed in life. Eventually, the rest pay off. Eventually, you get rewarded. But even in times that doesn't, God will use that. He will even take your failures and use those for his glory. Even the parts of your life you don't like, even the messes in your life, even the sins in your life, God will take everything in your life if you will dedicate it to him, dads and men and women, and just say, God, take me luck, stock and barrel, just the way I am. God will use it for his glory. So I got a question for you. What risk have you known God wanted you to take, but you didn't? You just didn't. Maybe the risk is you need to go ask forgiveness from someone. 
or you need to go offer forgiveness to someone else. Here's what I want you to see as your next fill-in. A safe life is a wasted life. And in that second Samuel passage we read about the three heroic men in David's life, they didn't play it safe. They, they jumped into the midst of the battle. And they are honored in Scripture for it. Because a safe life is a wasted life. And if you want everything safe in your life, you will live a wasted life. Jesus put it this way in Luke 19. Risk your life and you get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe and you'll end up holding the bag. I love it. You just end up holding the bag. See, the loser is not the person who took the risk and failed. The loser is the person who never took the risk. And why? If what you're doing is ultimately done in love and done for the glory of God and done in faith, you cannot be considered a failure. Why? Because the Bible says love never fails. And here at Southside, we've done a lot of things that failed. But I didn't let the fear of failure stop me from doing them. We take risks because risking is another word for faith. And God calls us to step out in faith. In other words, when the Bible says, what is the definition of faith? You could substitute the word risk. Because when you take a risk, you step out on that risk, you're stepping out on faith for Jesus Christ. You know, one of my personal heroes in the Bible is the Apostle Paul. I mean, this man, uh, he took unbelievable risks. He is eventually primarily responsible for spreading the gospel all through the Roman Empire. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament for us, primarily while he was in prison waiting execution. He did all this, not for his personal benefit, but for you and me today. And I want you to, as I read through his story here, I want you to read some of the things he went through, the risk he experienced while he was doing this, found in 2 Corinthians 11. I have worked harder, been put in jail more often, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again and again. Five times I was given 39 lashes. That's 195 lashes. What do you think his back looked like? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned with rocks. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I drifted out in the open sea all night and the whole next day. I traveled many weary miles and often been in great danger from flooded rivers, from robbers, from my own people, as well as from others. I faced grave dangers from mobs and cities and from death in the deserts and in stormy seas and from men who claim to be brothers in Christ, but who are not. I've lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. Often I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. And often I've shivered with cold and without enough clothing to keep me warm. And then he tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 why he did all this. Look what he says. Why do you think I'm risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine is guaranteed by the resurrected Jesus? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic? Not on your life. It's the resurrection that undergirds what I do and what I say and the way I live. You see, the superhero dads, they take risk. So dads, here's what I want you to know. Get your eye off the problem and get your focus on the person of Jesus Christ. Get your eyes off your ego and onto eternity. Let God use you to take some risk. Yes, you may fail in some of them. So what? Get up and start over. Now you know what doesn't work. You see, this life is preparation for eternity. This life is a test. It's preparing us for the next life. And how you sacrifice here will determine what rewards God will give you when you stand before him. So dads, what are you willing to risk for the glory of God, for your own growth, and to help other people? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, If we never live again after we die, then we might as well go out and have ourselves a good time. In other words, let us eat, drink, and be merry. What's the difference? For tomorrow we die and that ends everything. Don't be fooled by those who say such things. Paul says, if this is all there is, let's quit having church. Let's just go out and get plastered every night of the week. And when I looked at this passage, it made me think I have known a lot of dads, a lot of dads who call themselves Christians, but they've lost the joy of their salvation. They're not excited anymore about serving the Lord. They're bored with their relationship with God. They're bored with their relationship to the church. They're bored about everything in life. It's all been sucked right out of them. How do you get that going again? You take a risk with Jesus Christ. And if you're not risking anything, you're just going to stay the same. You're just like uh, Paul talks about babies. You're just splashing around in the baby pool. You need to go out in the deep surf where the big waves are. 
And dads, if your life is not what you want it to be, if you're not where you want to be, here's why. You're not risking anything for Jesus Christ. I read this week of a father who said thousands and thousands of times to his children this motto. This was his. I'll do the best I can with what I have for Jesus Christ today. Dads, that's a motto every one of you need to have. Put down in your Bible, or put it on the mirror, put it in your car. Are you willing to be the best you can in spite of the risk, in spite of the potential failure for Jesus Christ today? Are you modeling these character traits to your children, Dad? Taking risk, sacrificing, standing up for what's wrong. Don't make the fatal mistake, men or women, just trying to live in comfort. You're not put on this planet to live in comfort. This life is a test for the next life. How are you doing with it? I read about a guy named Mark Armstrong. He's a Christian writer who tells a story about uh, being invited to a men's uh, weekend retreat. He said there was about 40 men there. He said, um, but he noticed that when the discussion got rather intense about the needs of men and all, there was this young man there about, he was, he was a young, he was young, in his early 30s. He said, when I looked over at this young man named Jason, he said, I could tell he was just sobbing. He was just sobbing. And he said out loud, why didn't my dad want me? I don't understand why my dad didn't want me. Why didn't he want me, man? What's wrong with me? And none of the other men in the room could, they never responded. Most of them didn't know how to respond. Finally, this, uh, he finally said out loud, he says, I'm, I'm such a defect. I must be unlovable as a son. And I must be unlovable as a man. And what happened shocked everybody else. An older man by the name of Phil got up, walked around, he sat down next to this young man named Jason. He put his arms around him, allowed him to sob on his shoulder, and he said, Jason, I'll be the dad your dad never was. And from that moment on, he took Jason under his wing. He met with him for lunch. He did all the things a dad would do. He mentored him. He listened to him. He counseled him. He helped him grow spiritually. And just before his death, before Phil's death, he was asked, after all these years of doing this for this young man named Jason, he says, if you could wrap it up in one statement, what would you say? He said, Jason is my son. You older dads, you older men, would you please step up and mentor some young men in our church for Jesus Christ? I know you have jobs. I know you have families. But would you step up and model to these younger men, these younger dads in our church, how to be a godly husband, how to be a godly man, how to be a godly father? Would you do this for them? I read a story written by a reporter named Christina Drove. She was a volunteer event coordinator at her middle school. And she decided, uh, along with the school, to put on this breakfast called Breakfast with Dad. And so they, they had all this publicity about it and sent out flyers and everything. She said, I thought it was a way to engage the students' families during the school day. It's especially important for middle school students to see that their dad loves them and cherishes them. She said, but as we were getting closer to the launch day of doing this, she said, I realized 150 of those Students, mainly boys, their dads were not going to come for whatever reason. Either weren't in their life or they weren't going to show up. So she posted a request on Facebook for men to show up and be dad to these students. She thought maybe a few men would volunteer. It went from 100 to 400, and at the event, over 600 men showed up to be a surrogate dad to children whose dad was not going to be there for that breakfast. And when you look at the pictures of this, I went to her website. When you look at the pictures of this, kids are crying that these men showed up to be a surrogate dad when their own dad would not do that. And one father was holding a sign that says this, our sons and our children matter no matter 
who brought them into the world. Will you do that, dads? Most of you know that Algie and I have become a, I've become a surrogate dad to Hollem. In fact, they're going to get here about 2 o'clock today. <laughs> they're driving in. And I've watched that kid grow from 10 years of age up, and I'm proud of the, the man he's become, but it took a lot of my time to get this young man to where he needs to be. Does he still mess up? Oh, yes. Do I talk to him about it? Oh, yes. There are young men in our community that need a surrogate dad. It's time we as a church quit sitting in these pews and we get out there and we do what God has called us to do. Be the church in this community. And if you don't want to do that, then you're free to go somewhere else. Can I be any clearer than this? Because we've got kids dying and going to hell. It's time we stop just coming in here, being comfortable here. We need to get out in the world and say, Jesus Christ loves you and so do I. I am tired of seeing women raise young men in this world. They need a male figure in their life. They need a godly man in their life to show them. Because there's some things they don't need to learn from a woman. Right, women? Can I get the amen from the women? Yes. They need to hear it from a godly man. And if they don't, they're going to make the wrong choices in life. And that falls back on us. Jesus said this in Mark 8, 35, If you try to keep your life for yourself, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. And I would add to that, you'll be a true superhero. God's going to reward you for investing into the lives of other people, especially your children and children around you. And these three qualities I just shared with you, we can do this as men and as dads and as people. In fact, as I conclude here, there's a story in the Bible in Matthew 25 where Jesus tells a, a parable about a, a man he brought in three servants. He gave one five talents, one two, and one one. He said, now I'm going away on a trip. Take the money and invest it. Well, when he comes back, the one who had five had doubled it to ten. Now, you need to realize that one talent alone, just one talent alone in that day, was equivalent to 20 years labor and wages. So the one he gave five, he literally gave him 100 years of wages. That guy goes out and doubles it. He comes back with, with a payoff of 200 years of paid wages. He gave the second one two which is equivalent of 40 years. He comes back with double. He's got 40. He gave the other one one, which is 20 years of, of paid wages. He comes back with the same thing. He did nothing with it. And he's rebuked for it. In fact, what he has is taken from him and given to another. You see, he was more afraid of losing what he had than multiplying what God had given him. So dads, I have a question for you. Are you more afraid of losing what you've got than multiplying what God has given you? What has God given to you? He's given you talent, skills, abilities, and resources. Use them to invest in kids in our community, kids at school, your own kids, kids your kids are friends with, kids in your neighborhood, kids we have here whose fathers may not show up. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 29, anybody who sacrifices home, family, and fields, whatever, because of me will get it all back a hundred times over, not to mention the considerable bonus of eternal life. He's talking about heaven. We need men to be godly. We need men to be superheroes. Not perfect, but to take what God's given them and multiply it for the glory of God. In this whole series, we're going to look at different people from Scripture who stand out as heroes. There are, we're going to look at more qualities of what it means to be a superhero. And I hope you'll stay with us through this whole series. Because if you do... You can make the difference in a lot of people's lives, especially the lives of children. That's, that's how you become in the ranks of the superheroes. Let's pray. Father God.